a tree is planted by water, it receives all the water that it ever needs. And you've got to think about the soil by a river or a pond. It's a little bit muddy. So those roots have got to sink deeper and deeper and deeper until they root into something that is very, very strong. We as Christians have got to be rooted in the Word of God. Yeah. Amen. Today's world as it is, we have got to be ready for anything that Satan can throw at us. Amen. And we've got to be ready by giving it the Word of God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord again today. And it's cold outside, but it feels good in here. There's a lot of love and warmth I feel here with my church congregation and family, and I appreciate that. Brother Tinas, I've, I think you're doing a good job. I do. That ain't the easiest thing to learn back there. I know when you see all them buttons and switches, it looks like something off the space shuttle. And uh, I think you're doing a good job, and, and, and we appreciate that. But with all that being said, do we have any first-time visitors here with us at Wedgefield Baptist Church? If you could raise your hand and say, this is the first time I've ever been. We got some pointing over here, and we got some over here. So it's great to have you. If you could keep your hands raised up, we got a little information to give you. Just... Get them way up there where they can see you. Hiya. It don't matter. Look at y'all smiling. There you smile. Y'all know Allie? She's a good gal, ain't she? Yeah, we love her very much. But there's a little bit of information on that card about us, and there's a little information that we request about you. Um, not getting into your business, but just to know a little bit to know about you. If you could, just fill that out and drop that in the offering plate with a check addressed to Bubba Ben and Haley. I deeply appreciate that. I'll fill it out. I'll fill out the amount. You leave that blank. But again, it's good to have everybody with us in the house of the Lord. If you would, please pull out your prayer concern list. For those of you visiting with us this morning, it's in the middle of the uh, bulletin. I've got a few names to add to it, and I've got quite a few to highlight. I need to add Miss Darlene Tyler for health. This is Sister Sharon's sister. She'll be going into surgery, and I don't think Sharon of mine if I mention that they've got to remove a 10-pound mass in her abdomen. 10-pound mass. Um, we need to pray for travel mercies for Miss Sharon's family as they go to be with her. Need to add my wife Lisa to the list. Yes, ma'am. Who's that, Miss Opal? T.C. Sanford? Okay, we got him. Okay, y'all be careful going, too. T.C. Sanford for help. I'd like to add my wife, Lisa. She's going through some urinary problems. She's going to have to go to the hospital when I leave here today. I know it. Um, it's good to see Brother Jimmy Broadway. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Much, much prayer answered there. Um, I didn't call him this morning because I figured he'd be here, so it's good. I want to add my, um, my daughter, Katie, traveling. Okay. Peggy. Okay, Peggy for traveling and Chris for health. Okay. All right. But again, it's, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank God for that. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Praise God for seven blooming yellow daffodils. Okay? All right. Thank you, Sister Eileen. But it's good to see Brother Jimmy. Um, a lot of prayer is ushered out and a lot of prayers answered for Brother Jimmy. And uh, God's in the prayer answering business. And we thank him for that. And it's good to see Brother Jimmy back with us. Amen. Um, Need to remind or uh, add in, in remembrance, Miss Linda Johnson. I see the worst half of her here today, Brother Tommy. And, uh, but Sister Linda, we'll be praying for her. Um, we'd like to also remember the Hadley and Hayden uh, Bays. That's the great grands of Mr. and Mrs. Jackson. We need to keep them on prayer concern list. And uh, don't forget Brother Danny Gray, Sister Annette Wells for health. We need to keep them uh, 
lifted up in prayer. We need to lift everybody up. I mean, it's, we, don't need to we need to highlight the whole church. You know what I mean? Every brother, every sister that might be going through something. Because there's a lot of people here that may not put something on the list. But may need assistance in prayer. So we need to be uh, in prayer for them too. Just Amen. thinking about everybody. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, it's, it's a, a surety, dear God, that we're going to have problems in our life. But Lord, what is more assured is that you have the saving grace and you have the power, dear Father, to answer all prayers. Dear Father, we learned in, church, in Sunday school today, dear God, that you are unchanging, unfailing, always giving and always for the good of all of us. And you have that in your heart for us, God. God, what more do we need, dear Lord, for our lives? But God, sometimes there comes things, God, that we just can't handle. Lord, you made us that way because you wanted us to lean on you and not ourselves because you are the rock of all ages. God, you are the rock, dear Father, that we can turn to, dear Christ Jesus, when the world is upon us and the devil says we're not good enough. But God, your grace tells us that we are justified, which means, dear Lord, we are just like we ain't never sinned before when you look at us. And that's because of the precious saving grace of your son, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for it today. God, we come to you today, dear Lord, in hoping that we can do all things empowered by the Holy Spirit to lift you up and glorify you today. God, it's not about us. God, it's not about us self-serving ourselves, Lord. It's about us serving you. Dear Father, we've learned today in our also in our Sunday school lesson that all things, dear God, are possible through you. That even though the circumstance seems insurmountable, dear God, you can make us overcome it. David walked through the shadow, shadow of the valley of death. God, he didn't remain in it. He came through it. God, you saw him through it. Lord, you will see us through everything in our lives. God, I pray for anybody in this congregation that is going through some type of sickness to, today. Dear God, it said in the scripture that you tarried for three days while Lazarus laid dead. God, you didn't tarry. You did exactly what you did because you were exactly on time. God, your power is immense. God, there is nothing we've never asked for that you had never give us. Just help us and be reminded this to see it in the small things that you do for us every day. God, I ask blessings upon the pastor today that he may say something through your inspired word that would change a life for an eternity. Make one come closer to you, Lord, that slipped away. Make one come to saving grace that's never, ever felt it. I ask you, God, to be with us today. In everything we do, may we glorify you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray it. Amen.
sweet Jesus, my Savior, you are my faithful friend. You made me, you know me, you see my every sin. And my soul is amazed by this gift of your grace and these arms that take me in. Sweet Jesus, my Savior, you are my faithful friend. Sweet Jesus, my shelter. chapter number 12, Luke chapter number 12, I want to look at verses 37 through verses 40, four verses for our reading today, I got good news, Jesus is coming. And I got bad news. Jesus is coming. We need to be prepared for that day. The return of our Lord is just as certain as I'm standing in front of you today. It's more nearer than I believe I could even convince you that it is. And I believe in these last days we need to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. And that's what we've been trying to do since the beginning of the year. That's what we'll try to do today but I want to get I want you to get it in your mind and in your thought and in your conscience I want it embedded in the deepest corridors of your heart the fact and the truth that Jesus Christ is coming what will it look like when it gets here and I got another question for you what will he look like when he gets here those are some things we're going to talk about today if you have your places Luke chapter 12 if you please stand to your feet just four verses Beginning at verse 37, the word of the Lord says, Blessed are those servants. That's you and I who are saved. Whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find what? Shall find watching, waiting, anticipating, anxiously seeking. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. 
And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch, or find them, so blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Verse 40, Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. You may be seated. You know, I, I sometimes I <laughs> I can't get a grip on grace. I understand its concept. I understand that we're saved by grace. And there's no other word for it but amazing. Most of you don't know me. You don't know my past. I don't like to talk about me or brag about my past. But I want you to know how amazing God's grace is. Sometimes I ride down the road and I think about days gone by. Y'all, I was saved at the age of 10 years old. I had a drug problem. I got drugged to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Every time they had a revival, I got drugged to church. I was taught the precepts and principles of the Word of God by my father. I was taught many wonderful attributes by my mother. I have no excuse to tell you what I'm about to tell you. At the age of 18, I left off for Bible college. I was on fire for the Lord. We'd had a small revival in our church. And, and I didn't feel like the Lord was calling me to, to preach, but I felt like if He did, I'd be ready when He did, never knowing what would transpire the next few years. Some things happened in my life that I didn't understand that blew me away I got bitter on the Lord and I left the church and I left him and I began to live a life and do things that I'd be scared to tell you from this pulpit you say you say God will call somebody like you beloved if you read the Bible you'll understand that that's mostly who he calls he takes the ordinary and he makes them extraordinary he takes people with faults and failures who, who he can build faith upon and those are the instruments that he uses. I'm amazed. I'm amazed that Jesus Christ loves me. It's amazing. I am further amazed that he would go through the links and debts that he did to save me. I don't know why he loves me. I don't know why he would do the things he did to save me. I have no idea. Sundays come so fast and often I find myself saying Lord you saved me you love me but why did you call me to stand before that congregation in the morning Lord couldn't you have found somebody else couldn't you have found somebody more qualified couldn't you have found somebody more perfect somebody more willing somebody who can speak better why did you choose me I can't answer that other than it's amazing and it's grace amazing grace how sweet the sound it gets sweeter to me every day in those years when I left the church and I left God I took some people with me I tore up some hearts and I took a little white headed boy with me who has more stories of long dirt roads and things that never should happen than he'll ever be able to tell. And so I was thinking, God, why'd you love me? Why'd you save me? Why'd you call me? And why'd you call him? This morning, he's going to sing our testimony of how it all happened. And what the end result's going to be. I love all of my people. Every one of you with all of my heart. But I got a special place in my heart for Brother Jim Smoke. Jesus 
came for me to be born of a virgin and dwelt among men and my examples here. The word became flesh and the light shined among us. His glory
pray with me, please. Father, Lord, we've been blessed already. I believe if we gave the benediction right now, I'd be perfectly satisfied, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of the works of the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly dwelling. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. And here's the promise we now await. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. Father, now as we come to the hour of preaching, I pray, Lord, that you would give us unction and utterance. Lord, hide us behind the cross. I used to not understand what that, what that meant. But I do more clearly today. And that is that I not be seen at all. That Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, that he be our focus of worship in this hour. As thy servant, Lord, I'm as humble as I can be to be able to proclaim the wonderful truth of the gospel. And I pray, Lord, now that my thoughts would become yours and my voice would become yours and you would speak through us. And God, that you'd use the Holy Spirit of God to open our hearts and minds to the truth of your word today. I render myself to you. These people, we render ourselves to you. Lord, whatever you would have for us to do today, I pray we'd be sensitive to your spirit and move accordingly in obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ comes more clearly in focus as we see the world events grow increasingly grim. You don't need me to tell you if you have television or, or any other form of communication. You understand that what Paul said to Timothy in the book of Timothy that we've talked about over the past couple of weeks is that perilous times are here. They're not coming. They're not on the horizon. They are here. We are living in those perilous times. He said that evil men and uh, false teachers and seducers shall wax worse and worse. We are living in those times. It says the love of many shall wax cold. We are living in those times. And it also says there will be a great turning away from the truth that men and women will not endure sound doctrine. What we preach here at Wedgefield Baptist Church in this pulpit is sound doctrine. It's the truth of the Word of God. That's what we preach it. We preach it from A to Z. We preach the good, the gooder, the bad, the badder, the ugly, and the uglier. However it's written in this book, that's what we teach and that's what we preach. And you are getting a dose of the truth. And the truth that we are sharing from the beginning of just this year until God says, okay, change the subject. We're going to be preaching and teaching the truth of end time events. On Sunday nights, uh, we have started a series from the rapture of the church until eternity and all those events uh, that will unfold during those times. And today I want to talk to you about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in essence of some things that John on the Isle of Patmos saw when God gave him a vision of these times. He saw ten things. And I want to share about three of them with you today. We'll cover some more next week. But I want to share three things with you today about the Lord Jesus Christ and some things that John saw in Revelations chapter number 1. At any moment, Jesus Christ could return. In verse 1 of Revelations chapter number 1, it says that the time is short. In verse number 3, Paul, uh, John says, being inspired of the Holy Spirit, he says that the time is at hand. Now, I realize that he wrote that thousands of years ago. But if you think about time in general, time is always short for every generation. Compared to eternity, the life that you and I lived is almost nothing. I mean, it, it can't even register if there was any scale of time and eternity such as you and I know it. Our time is short. 
and it's short upon this earth. But I believe you and I are living in a time now where the revealing or the unveiling, which is what revelation means, the unveiling of God's truth is here, the unveiling of His mysterious coming is here, and I think you and I are going to see it with our own eyes upon this earth. I believe we're just that close. Someone said as Christians, we should be watching, we should be waiting, we should be preparing for His turn. And, and this is what they said. They said, we ought to live, Brother David said, we ought to live like He died yesterday. We ought to live like He was resurrected this morning. And we ought to live like He's coming back this afternoon. And that's the way Christians ought to live. And that's the way that you and I should be watching for the return of Christ. And what will it look like when He comes? John caught a glimpse of that, and I'm going to read it to you in Revelations, chapter number 1. You can jot this down if you wish. You can turn there real quick. Revelations, chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 7 through 11a. Revelations, chapter 1, verses 7 through 11a. The scripture says, Behold, he is talking about Jesus. Behold, he cometh with clouds. You ever wonder what that meant? You ever study that? What does that mean that he's coming with clouds? Is he going to be surrounded by clouds? Or is there going to be dark clouds around him? And some people really get far out in fairy tale land and say, Is he going to be riding a cloud when he comes back? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's the furthest thing from the truth. He's going to be riding a stallion, a white one as a matter of fact but that's not what it's talking about you ever read Revelation chapter 12 when it talks about the cloud of witnesses wherefore we have such a great cloud of witnesses you ever heard that you know who these clouds are you and I he's coming back with us beloved when he comes back he's not coming back alone the armies of the Lord the redeemed of the Lord the saved servants of Jesus Christ we're going to come back with him to this earth to rule and to reign we won't have to do any fighting amen as a matter of fact he isn't going to have to do any fighting he's going to speak amen and we're going to have the victory for all eternity so it says behold he cometh with clouds now listen to this and every eye shall see him every eye that's my eyes that's your eyes that's the eyes of our forefathers that's the eyes of these men and women in scriptures Everybody, even, it's going to say here in just a little bit, even the people that pierced him, the ones who slayed him, the ones who, who put him to death on the cross, their eyes are going to witness him to every man, woman, boy, and girl that's ever breathed the breath of life is going to see Jesus coming back with his army, the host of the redeemed. Can you imagine what a day that's going to be and what a sight that's going to be but can you imagine it on the other side of redemption where Jesus Christ was rejected and all of a sudden here he comes with his host with the armies of the glories of heaven and he's coming back to rule and to reign with a rod of iron behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. Verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, verse 9, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and in patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, and it said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Now, the Alpha and Omega are the two bookends of the Greek alphabet, if you will. If I were to say it in English, he would say, I'm A and I'm Z. And as a matter of fact, I'm everything in between. Alpha means the first letter. Omega means the last letter. He is the first and he is the last letter and word of God Almighty. Someone said, Jesus is God's first word 
Jesus is God's full word, and Jesus is God's final word. In him we live and dwell and have our being. Do you know what it means when you say Jesus? When you say Jesus, you have said it all. Because he is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. John said, in the beginning was the Word. He is the beginning of all eternity. He is the ending of all eternity. Everything that was ever made, he made it. And when it's all gone, he'll still be here in existence. He brought it in to existence and he'll be the consummation of its existence. He always was. He always will be. God, Alpha, and Omega. Now, I'm talking about Jesus. I'm still talking about Jesus. I know I've said some things that, that means omniscience. He's Alpha and Omega. I said some things that, that would make you believe he's omnipotent. He's Alpha and Omega. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. I'm talking about Jesus. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's everything. He's all points in between. Now, see, some people will have you think he was just a man. He was a man. Every much as a man as you and I. But he was also God, and, and every much God as God, the very God of God, was Jesus. He's both man, and he's both God. And he's all the things of the Godhead being. Some people would have you to think he was just a sweet little Galilean peasant boy. And although he was a sweet little Galilean peasant boy, guess what he was? Walking in those shoes. Alpha and Omega. The beginning and end. Some people would have you to think that he was just a great teacher. And beloved, there has been no greater teacher ever walked upon this earth than Jesus Christ in his short 33 and a half year ministry. No greater teacher has ever touched his feet to the dirts of this earth like Jesus Christ, Alpha and Omega. Some people would have you to believe that he was a great philosopher or that he was just a good person. But, beloved, he was more than a teacher. He was more than a peasant boy. He was more than a philosopher. He was more than a good person. He was God incarnate come down in the flesh. That's who he was. Emmanuel, God with us. You don't tip your hat to a man like that. You don't tip your hat to a God like that. Can I say that? This is what you do to a God like that. You bow down prostrate on your knees and on your face before him because he's God almighty. You don't tip your hat and say, good job, sir. You bow down and you cry, holy, 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 Lord God almighty, art thou to receive honor and glory and praise and dominion forever and ever and ever, oh God. It's one thing to say holy, but the Jewish people, when they say holy, 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 that means something different. He is the holiest of holies. When you say holy, 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 I'm talking still. How about Jesus? Y'all all right? And here's the thing. Saved, lost, dead, or alive, every eye will see Jesus when he returns, both great and small. You see, what does that mean? The beggar is going to bow, and the billionaire is going to bow. Everybody will bow at the feet of of Jesus. Do you realize I'm looking at you and you're looking at me? One day you're going to bow whether you like it or not. You don't have to bow now, honey, but you're going to. Listen, people can mock God, they can ridicule him, they can disbelieve him, they can spit in his face, they can tell him to go fly a kite. They can say, I don't want nothing to do with him. They can say, I don't believe in him. They can say, he's a fake. He's a phony. He's a fairy tale. He's not real. They can call him anything. They can say anything. They can do anything. But I can assure you today, standing on the word of God, that same person, beloved, is going to bow at Jesus' feet and cry, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We can do it now or we can do it 
later. But John saw some things, and I want to share them and move along quickly here, and I'm just getting started. And I'm already out. So much for that. But I want to try to share three things today, and then we're through. Number one, and, and, and a lot of people ask me this question, but he, he was undiminished in his humanity. A lot of people think that when Jesus Christ came out of the grave that he was, he was not a man, he was a spirit. That's not true. He was still a man. Remember he told Thomas, he said, Thomas, come here and touch the nail prints on my hand. Come here and touch my side. He was still a human being. When, when, when Christ ascended into heaven, he didn't turn into some spirit. He's not sitting on the right hand of God now like, like he's some kind of spirit and you can't see him. He's, he's still a human being. He's still in bodily form. John hadn't seen John saw him. This same John on the Isle of Patmos, he saw him when he ascended. And it's been about 60 years since he has seen him in the flesh. And now here in Revelation chapter 1, he is seeing him again in fleshly form. He's seeing his body. And so Jesus stands before him. He is an ascended Lord, but he has maintained his humanity. Y'all all right? You see, Jesus, he didn't temporarily become a man. He voluntarily chose to stay a man. Whenever he decided to step out of glory and come down to Bethlehem stable and take on the form of a flesh and become a servant, to become like you and I, to be acquainted with grief like you and I. He chose to stay that way. There's reasons why he chose to stay that way. The first thing, he, he, Brian, I believe the reason why he, he walked on earth as long as he did is so he could experience everything that you and I experience on this earth. He could understand being cold and being hot. He could understand having pain and hurting. He could understand him le losing family members and people spitting at him and not loving him, not caring about him, mocking him and calling him names, not hanging around with him because he was different. He could understand all the things that you and I experience. That's what a writer of Hebrews says, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity but in all points tempted like as we, yet without sin. He walked on this earth as long as he did and only as long as he did so that he could feel everything imaginable to human flesh. He knows, beloved, what you go through. He knows what I go through. He feels our sorrow. He feels our pain. He feels our depression. He feels our discouragement. He feels all of those things. But when he ascended up into heaven, he didn't get rid of it. He kept it. He kept it. He's connected. He, he connected himself with us so that we could be connected to him. He connected himself with humanity so humanity could be connected to him. So that we could realize, so we could affiliate ourselves with who he is. When we see him, he's not going to be a spirit floating around in heaven like Casper the Friendly Ghost, beloved. He's going to be Jesus Christ who was crucified on the cross and he walked out of the grave. Listen to one of the greatest promises in all of the Bible. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth him not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear. Listen. Listen. Listen to this. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Does that do anything for you? Somebody check your pulse real quick. Make sure you're alive and breathing. We're called the sons of God. Behold, now we are the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear... We shall be like him. I'm going to be like Jesus. Why? Because we shall see him as he is. How will he be when we see him? He'll still be in human bodily form. 
Y'all all right? Fanny Crosby wrote a song. She was a wonderful woman. I'm going to try to sing it. I believe this is why it means so much that he continues to be in human, bodily, fleshly form. When my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side and his smile will be the first to welcome me. Listen, I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. Hey, we won't have to wonder who he is when we get there, amen. We'll know who he is because he'll still be in the bodily, fleshly form. He'll have the print of the nails in his hand and in his feet and the piercing in his side and the scars from the thorns on his head. You won't have to ask who he is because there won't be another one there like him, amen. He'll still have those scars that, that, that bears the mark of the price he paid on Calvary for the souls of men, hallelujah. That's why John 3.16 says he's the only begotten son. It means there's never been another one like him. There never will be one like him. He's Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, our friend, our refuge, the lover of our souls, our bishop and caretaker. Amen? I'm talking, I'm still talking about Jesus. There was a fellow that came to London one time, and he was making out that he was Jesus he had people following him multitudes of people believing that he was the Christ who had come to earth one night he was out in an open air place in the mall or whatever you call those places square in the city or something like that and he was speaking to some people and this small band of Salvation Army folks came by and they were singing the song that I just sang to you. I shall know him, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. And it dawned on one of the people in the crowd, go check his hands. <laughs> Somebody in the crowd went over and looked at his hands and there wasn't no scars. Guess what? Everybody got up and left. That ain't him. That ain't him. Beloved, we'll know him because he'll bear the marks of the great love wherewith he loved us and the price that he paid to redeem us from our own sin. Amen? We'll know him. Undiminished humanity. Number two, I got to go. I've been studying a lot about heaven in preparation for this, this ongoing series. And I've come across some very interesting things. They're not Bible things, but they're theories, and, but, they're, but they're interesting things that make you, that make you study. The second thing is he's unrivaled in his majesty. Look back at Revelation chapter 1. Y'all all right? So 11, he says, I'm Alpha and Omega. And then John says in verse 12, he says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and behold, I saw seven golden candlesticks. That's verse number, number 12. And then verse number 13 says, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with the garment, down to the foot, and girt about with paps, and a golden girdle. Now, when you study those things, there's two things that you see in that garment that he's wearing. If you study that garment, there's two things that you see. Number one is the garment of a king. We all know that he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, but if you study it further, you also see it's the garment of a judge. So he is both king and judge. We'll get to that in just a moment. 
But when you talk about his, his might and his majesty and his glory and his splendor, and I'm still talking about Jesus, it's unrivaled by no other. There's nothing that you can compare to him. So I've been studying about heaven a little bit and what heaven is and where heaven is and, 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 and the dwelling place of God and what does that look like and where is it. Well, you know there's three heavens. There's three heavens, and first heaven, of course, is we can relate to that heaven because that's, that's where the birds fly. That's where the ducks fly and the doves and the pigeon. That's the first heaven. That's the sky. You can see that. The second heaven is the one you see better at night. That's where the stars and the galaxies and the moon and the sun and the planets and more planets and, and galaxies and all those things are. That's the second heaven. The third heaven is the dwelling place of God Almighty on His throne. That's the third heaven. Paul talks about that in Corinthians. He said that one time, he, he, said, he, he used it in a third person like it was somebody else, but I believe it was him. He said, I, I, I went up to the third heaven, and I saw some things that it's unlawful for me to speak about. I can't even talk about the things that I saw. But when he mentioned that third heaven, he's talking about up in the third heaven where God dwells. Well, this certain thing that I was reading, it said this. It said this about heaven. It says, if we traveled at the speed of light, at the speed of light, that's pretty fast, 187,000 miles per second, that's the speed of light. So if we were to travel from this earth, from anywhere on this earth, we would travel from this earth to the foot of the throne of God, traveling at the speed of light, 187,000 miles per second, it's proposed that it would take us three and a half years to get there. That's a long time, isn't it? It would take us three and a half years to get to God's throne, traveling at the speed of light, 187,000 miles per second. Now, this is what Acts says about that. God said, heaven is my throne. And earth is my footstool. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. 187,000 miles per second. Three and a half years. And our God is so great. Our God is so awesome. Our God is so majestic. It says, The earth is my footstool. Folks, can I tell you something? There's nothing that compares to that kind of God. There's nothing that awesome. There's nothing that majestic. And here it is. There's nothing that big. Pastor, I got some big problems. I've got some big concerns in my family. I got some big issues down at the job. I've got some big trouble with my children. I'm having some big problems with my relationship with my wife. I mean, Pastor, you don't understand. I've got, I've got some big problems. You just don't understand. Well, I'll tell you what I do understand. There's somebody bigger than your problems, amen. There's somebody bigger than your concerns, bigger than your fears, bigger than your worries, bigger than all of life's issues. And he is Jesus Christ. Our beloved, our friend, our Savior is Jesus. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, John saw another vision. It's the vision of the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20 that will happen to unbelievers. And this is what he said, and I saw a great white throne, that's where Jesus Christ will sit. Remember I told you the robe represents his kingship, but it also represents him being judged. God has turned the judgment of the world over to Jesus Christ. He'll be the one sitting on the throne. He'll be the one that you and I stand in front of. But he says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. Listen, I'm talking about Jesus yet. I'm talking about him and all of his majesty. And it says, I saw a great white throne. I saw him that sat on it, which is Jesus, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. 
What I'm trying to tell you is he's so glorious. He's so majestic. He's so wonderful. Heaven and earth can't even look him in the face. You want me to tell you one of the reasons why we're going to bow down at him? Another reason is because you can't look at him. You won't be able to look at him until you get a glorified body like unto Jesus' body. And then we'll be able to behold him in all of his splendor. You know one day I'm going to have one of them kind of bodies. This old rickety flesh, I don't know if that's a word or not. I like it. It sounds rickety. When I get up in the morning and I go to the refrigerator to get a glass of milk, I'm rickling all the way. Ain't I, baby? Uh-oh. She's rickety right now. She got a headache right now. That's why she had to go. But one day we won't have no more rickety bodies and we won't have no more headaches, Miss Jen. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Miss Jen was about to freeze to death. Her blood is thin as rickly. Yeah. Her blood is thin and rickly. Like witch hazel. <laughs> Miss Eileen. One day you're going to have a new body. You won't need Brother Sid. <laughs> you still love him though. Amen. But isn't it wonderful to thank? And so whenever I say to you this morning, whose face the earth and heaven fled away, here's a promise that Jesus makes right here. In Romans chapter 14, verse 11, he says, For it is written, this is what he said, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Number three, he's unbiased as a judge. I told you what the robe represented earlier. But here's, here's the truth. Here's the truth of the matter. Today, Jesus Christ is our advocate. Today, Jesus is our lawyer. He's our attorney. He's our mediator between God and man there's one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus he is urging God he is setting today he is setting on the right hand of God pleading his own blood against our sins he's saying Lord if Marie Straley has done anything to offend your law my blood has paid her sin debt she don't owe you anything and today he, he's speaking to you, he's speaking to all of us, he's reaching out to the world and he's saying, I love you and I want to save you more than anything else. I'm talking about this God who is this Jesus who wants to save you more than anything else today. But that same compassionate, loving, merciful, graceful God also is going to be our judge now to those of you and I who are saved who have been redeemed who have been bought by the blood of Christ there's now no condemnation you and I won't be at that judgment we'll be, we'll be at a different judgment but to all of those who have rejected Christ they will stand in front of him having rejected him and he will now become their judge he who was once their savior will now become their judge I'm talking about this awesome God that we've mentioned in all of his majesty we're going to stand in front of him and give an account for why we did not choose him I don't know about you but that's a scary thought that there's coming a day when you'll stand before him who gave his life a ransom for your soul and he's going to want to know why you rejected him beloved I don't want to stand before him when he judge when he judges sinners I don't want to stand before him having rejected the gift of his son Jesus came into this world to save sinners he came in this world to save you to save me to save all of mankind red yellow black or white they're all precious in his sight 
He loves the uneducated. He loves the educated. He loves the rich. He loves the poor. He loves the good, the bad, the ugly. He loves us all for God so loved the world that he gave the pearl of great price, heaven's great gift, so that you and I could be redeemed from the curse and penalty of sin. And whenever he calls you and he sends out an invitation to you that says, Come, come now, let us reason together. When he's calling to you just as I am without one plea and we sit in our pews and we say, I'm not coming, I'm not coming, I'm not coming, we're rejecting the gift that God has offered us. We're saying, I don't want your gift. You can take it and give it to somebody else. I don't need it and I don't want it. No, thank you. But that same Jesus that died on the cross and that same Jesus who came out of that grave three days later, victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave, that same Jesus will sit at the right hand of God as the judge to all of those who deny him, defy him, and have turned their backs on him. And the Bible says when he gets done with us, that he's going to hurl us into the lake of fire and brimstone, and that's where we'll forever be. And you know what will be playing in our minds over and over and over and over and over and over? That invitation that he sent out that said, Come now, let us read him together. And we said no. Beloved, have you said no? Have you said no to him? Has he been calling you and you've rejected him? Hey, have you had other things to do that's more important? I wonder how important it'll be when we stand before him. Have you, have you had other things to do that you just couldn't find time? Time won't matter anymore when we stand before him. Throw your clocks away, throw your watches away, throw your schedules away, throw your time cards away. When we stand before him at eternity, time will exist no more. Time's one of the most hard things to, uh, to, to define, isn't it? And one thing's for sure, it does not exist in heaven. Well, where's Tillman? No clocks in heaven. No schedules. I think, you know, I think time is a yardstick. Time is a yardstick, and that's, that's the way we measure life. That's the way we measure deterioration, is by the yardstick of time. You know why there's no time in heaven? God don't deteriorate. But, beloved, can I tell you something else? There's no time in hell either, and there's no end. And the only reason it's there in fact, it never was created for people. Did you know that? Hell wasn't created for men. It was created for the devil and his angels. But men will go there because they follow Satan and they refuse Christ. Oh, beloved, today, what if Jesus were to come back this afternoon? I mean, really, one day, somebody, it may not be me, but somebody's going to stand here and preach that sermon, and it's going to happen, and Jesus is going to come back. And everything we've been trying to tell you is going to be truth. And for some people, it would be a glorious day. As, as Grant and Carol sang about earlier, but for other people, it's not going to be glorious. It's going to be an awful thing. Wouldn't it be ashamed? Wouldn't it be ashamed to go out into eternity having to face Jesus and be condemned for, for sin? After all that he's done, after all that he offers, after all that he's given, wouldn't it be ashamed to go from a church meeting like this and go out into eternity? without God wouldn't it be awful you don't have to today Jesus is calling come now let us reason together the last invitation of the Bible says even so come would you come today every head bowed every eye closed Jesus is coming beloved are we prepared to meet him will we stand before him in victory being clothed in righteousness, being redeemed by His blood, worshiping Him, praising Him, bowing down to Him in all of His glory, or will we stand before Him in fright and fear, ashamed, guilty, having refused the greatest gift ever given? Have you said yes?
I want you to do this. If you're here today and you're saved and you said yes to the Holy Spirit and you've received His salvation, would you raise your hand? Look at there all over the house. Thank you. You may put him down. You may be here today and you say, Preacher, I've never been saved. I've never said yes. In fact, I've been putting it off. I've been saying no. There's just things I'm not ready to give up. Things I'm not ready to say goodbye to. Things I know I ought to do that I'm just not ready to, to be committed and I've never been saved. Jesus is calling you today, beloved. You may not ever have this chance, but you have it today. Would you say yes to him? Would you raise your hand and say, Preacher, I want to be saved. I want to say yes. Would you raise your hand? I just want to pray for you. I won't come to you and embarrass you in any way. Would you raise your hand? Father, Lord, you've seen the heart's response through the raising of hands. Many saying, I've been, I've been saved, I've been redeemed. Father, no one raised their hand and said they, they haven't said yes to you. And Father, our Lord, I pray that that's the case today. So as we go into this time of invitation, Lord, continue to speak to our hearts, Lord. Let us be sensitive, obedient, and do the things that you ask us to do today. Have your will and have your way. In thy name we pray. Amen. Please stand to your feet if you would. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just a minute of invitation. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Altar's open. If you need to come for any reason. I want you to do it real quick. Stand, you got some big problems. Well, you got a big God, you know, who loves you in a big way. And he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. He's bigger than your problem. He's bigger than your fear. He's bigger than your worry. He's bigger than your sickness. He's a big God, a mighty God, an awesome God. Would you come? God's people said, Amen. Thank you.